It was as late as Thursday evening that I was still unsure what direction I was going to go with the message this morning. It wasn't that I couldn't think of anything. It was that I had kind of three different directions to choose from. I mean, more than that, but three that had come to mind that I was mulling over. And um, and so what I ended up doing, I'm sure you won't mind, was rather than choose between them, decided to do all three. I see the look of concern on your faces. This may actually be shorter than normal this morning. But those three, those three different directions, um, one of them would be to follow up with Acts chapter 2, that passage we've been looking at. We've actually just been looking at verse 42 the last four weeks. Four different areas where it says the church in the book of Acts was devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. But there's a whole lot that follows that statement that describes their life together in those early days and weeks and months following the death and resurrection of Christ, following his ascension back into heaven, following the day of Pentecost that we look to as the birth of the church. There's a lot more in that passage describing that. And I thought, well, you know, it would really be nice to to at at least spend a little time in the rest of that passage. And then we planned our dedication of the peace poll for following this morning, and I thought, but, you know, it would really be good to, to kind of talk a little bit about what that represents in the life of the church. And then, of course, there's annual conference coming up. And there's the theme of annual conference, which I think is really healthy for us and helpful to us to spend at least a little time becoming aware of There's a whole lot available online, and I encourage you to go there. Go to brethren.org. Look for the annual conference links. You're going to be able to follow business. You're going to be able to to watch podcast or broadcast or live streaming of the evening worship services. There are a lot of ways to be connected with what's going on there. But the theme there has to do with, um, it's a little bit, A little bit odd sounding, but it really has some some deep substance to it. Uh, The theme has to do with being living parables, that you and I are living parables. So, which direction to go? And then I begin to see how they all really tie together. That's what I want to talk about for just a few moments this morning. See, as we look in in Acts chapter 2, and and we've heard it read this morning... Before our offering, we've heard it read for the last four Sundays. A lot of what's described in those few verses to follow are, are just the, the, the practical living out of those, of those commitments that the church had. Their commitment, their devotion to the teaching of the apostles as they, as they shared what they'd heard from Christ as they passed on his teachings and his life, having walked with him and talked with him, lived with him for three years as they followed him. Certainly, the devotion to the fellowship we read about in the, in the verses that follow, how that lived out, and that was just in, in amazing ways. The communion, the bread and the cup, not only that, but eating meals together and and their prayers. Let me just read this last part once again. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. See, this is the fellowship part. Even to the point of selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. A couple of things I want to highlight. One is is this is not just, the picture I get here is not just gutting it out devotion. It's not just gutted out commitment. There's a place to have that as a foundation to say no matter what, 
as God gives me strength, I am committed to following him. I am devo devoted to being part of his church. But the world's had enough of long-faced, committed followers of Christ. <laughs> Where is a place for the fire within us, for the delight within us to say, I'm following Christ because, because his love has been poured out in me, and my life has been changed, and I just can't keep it to myself. I mean, to really step on toes. I can talk to men and women here this morning, probably more the women, but um, is, is commitment enough in a marriage? Bree was smiling. I think maybe we've had this conversation a time or two. Oh, it's good to have. It's very important in a marriage. But what about delight? <laughs> What about, what about that love? What about enjoying one another? What about enjoying this relationship that, that God has brought together? And you get a feel for this, that this, these were people who liked to be together. These were people who were sacrificing for each other, going above and beyond selling their possessions and making the money available to others within the church, community within the fellowship who had needs. But you know what's interesting? Is there's a result to all this. There's a result to this devotion, this commitment to their faith and to the fellowship. There's a result of this delight-driven living in that fellowship of, I, I want to be here. I want to follow Christ together. I want to worship together. I want to pray together. I want to serve together. Verse 47 says, They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, that might be a little idealistic in today's day and age. You're not going to please everybody. But maybe if churches today were more like this, maybe the world around us would have less to criticize. They'll still find something if they want to. But maybe they would have less to criticize and maybe people on the outside would be a little bit more standing in awe of these people who really love and care for each other and want to be together. And interestingly, almost as a side note, Luke adds, after describing the church, and the Lord added to their number daily, those who were being saved. Not only was the people outside the fellowship watching them and observing and saying, wow, there's something real going on here, something attractive going on here. I want to be part of that. And they came and they inquired. And every day the family was growing and people were being added to their fellowship. So there certainly is a theme even here about about our outreach, about our witness, about being the light to the community around us. And it's not primarily just about programs. It's not primarily about, okay, we've got to have this outreach program. Those are fine and good. It's about being the church. It's about living with commitment, living with, with, with passion, with delight. It's, it's the love of Christ being real in us and living that out every day. And that just... It just spills out. It spills over. Being the light to the world around us. And of course, that led me to the Sermon on the Mount. As I was thinking about this fifth devotion, if you will, it's not stated in so many words, but but devoted to being a light, devoted to our witness to the world around us. 
and thought of the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount that, that we read together earlier in our scripture focus. What we call the Beatitudes immediately followed by, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Salt is, is intended to bring out flavor. It's intended to do good. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how can it accomplish anything? The clear indication there is it's possible for people, it's possible for churches to lose our saltiness in the, in the good sense. To lose that which can add flavor to the world around us can bring out flavor, that which is positive, is beneficial in so many ways that salt is. Unless there be confusion from that analogy, he adds another one and says, you are the light of the world, like a city up on a hill where everybody can see. You don't take a light and put it under a basket. No, a light is meant to, to be of benefit to other people. In the same way, he said, let your light shine. Let the good that you do shine forth, not so you can get praise. So the world around can see and can say, this is a follower of God. It's a follower of Jesus Christ and give glory where it's due. Yeah, there's a tough balance there, isn't there? Letting our light shine, but not for our glory. I think first we've got to settle in our hearts what the goal is. The goal is, as John the Baptist said of Jesus when he came to be baptized, he must increase, I must decrease. And if that is really the desire of our hearts, we won't have a problem letting our light shine. We won't have a problem living our life out following Christ, seeking his glory in every encounter, whatever it is we're doing. Scripture says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. And as we seek to live that out, then God's light is shining through us, and other people see that. We should not be afraid to be known as a follower of Christ at any moment of our lives. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I know I said it was going to be short, but in our dedication service. About what that post now can mean for us. Not as a completion of a project, it is that, but as, as a whole new beginning. But part of, part of the light that shines in us. Well, what does it look like? Well, that's, that's that first part of, of the Sermon on the Mount. That's the Beatitudes. That's God will bless or blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who are humble, those who are merciful to others. There's a long list there. And in the midst of all of that is blessed or God will bless those who work for peace, the peacemakers. For they will be called the children of God. You know, there's even more to that promise. There's even more to that part of it. They will be called the sons of God, the children of God. In the biblical culture, in, in, in the, the, the Hebrew culture, and even as they moved into the Greek and Roman world, this was still the, the case. To be the son of something meant to, to bear some resemblance. James and John... I'm not talking about who your real father were, was. James and John were known as the sons of Zebedee because Zebedee was their father. Okay, we understand that. They were also called the sons of thunder. Any ideas why? I can imagine that there was something about their personality and their character that was a little bit, you know, they're the ones who said, God, you want to... You know, this town that wouldn't, wouldn't accept our message. You want to call down lightning or whatever and destroy this town. Um, no wonder they got along well with Peter. He was kind of like that too in some ways. The sons of thunder, they're, they're thunder-like. 
in their demeanor. So when this says being peacemakers, working for peace so that you may be called sons, children of God, it's saying to be a peacemaker is to be godlike. That's pretty important, isn't it? It's part of our witness, part of part of the light that God will want to shine from our lives individually and collectively. The annual conference theme puts a whole other a whole other twist on that. The thought that you and I are living parables. See, Jesus told parables. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who, who planned a banquet, a big feast, and sent out invitations. But when the day of the banquet came, people began to send back their regrets, their excuses why they couldn't come. And so the master sent his servants out to other people who weren't initially invited and said, go and find the poor and the, the blind, the lame, and invite them to come in because I want, I want my banquet to be full. And we may be scratching our head a little bit, say, I don't, I don't fully get that, but there's something about that that says there's, there's something, the kingdom of God is a little bit like, like this story. And when we think about it, it tells us something of God and his heart for all people. It tells us a little bit of the history. Jesus was telling this in an audience of, of Jews, of, of scribes and Pharisees who were opposing his ministry. And there was a historical sense in which the invitation of, initially went out to the, the nation of Israel. And as many of them began to reject him personally, then the message went out to, to the whole world, to all of the, all of the Gentile world that all were invited. That tells us something about the kingdom. It tells us something about God. Other parables, and sometimes we're actually not sure between what's a parable and what's a story that really happened. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. That one's a little easier to understand. It's a story that tells us something about the Father's heart, about God's heart, even when we go astray longing for us to come back and celebrating when we do. The annual conference theme is, is challenging us that, that our lives are parables. Our lives can do the very same thing. A parable kind of, kind of takes something familiar and holds it up and helps people see something about God through something that's familiar to them. Do, do you get that connection that your life and mine can be that for other people? People get to know us, and I hope as they get to know us, they see some God-like characteristics in us. And it's not just our, it's not just our character and how we treat them that's important, but even our story. And each one of us has a story. Each one of us has a story that may illustrate something of God's faithfulness to us. It may illustrate something of God's provision for us, God's comfort of us. Each one of us, our story, our character, becomes something that can become familiar to other people in a way that someone else can see something of God and can learn something about God. And we need not fear that calling. We need to embrace that calling same way that we need to embrace the calling to let our light shine to the world around us. A lot of different pieces, but really all part of the same cloth. We need to be devoted to the teachings about the life, the death, the resurrection, the ministry, the teachings of Jesus that the apostles bore witness to. We need to be committed to our fellowship to this fellowship, to the fellowship of the broader community of the church around the world. We need to be committed to the traditions of, of communion, of the centrality of the death of Christ 
at the heart of our faith. We need to be committed to prayer, to praying together. We need to be committed, devoted to being a light in this world. May God give us the strength not just to be committed to that, but to be able to live out the delight that comes from knowing God, from knowing who he is, from growing in that knowledge, from worshiping and walking and and fellowshipping with and serving with our sisters and brothers in him. May God help us to be that. May the peace poll that we're about to dedicate be just one more part of our story together. Let me rephrase that. May the peace poll that is an opportunity for us to rededicate ourselves. It's not really about dedicating an object about dedicating ourselves to what it represents. And may it be so.